Hello and welcome to Ask GMBN Tech, the weekly show where we answer your questions. If you've got a question, get in the comments with hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. First question this week is from David Keane, and he wants to know, could you give me some thoughts on buying carbon frames secondhand? He's looking at buying a pivot for a very reasonable price, but strangely feel more worried about buying a carbon frame on site, although he's previously bought aluminium frames over the net based solely on photos. Yeah, it's a weird one. Um, I think there's maybe some, well, there's definitely a bit of stigma around carbon frames in that regard. To be honest with you, this probably flies in the face of um, popular thinking a bit, but I would rather buy a second-hand carbon frame that hasn't been heli-taped. Why? I mean, that's a really strange thing. I think when a carbon, well, when an aluminium frame takes a big ding, even through heli-tape, it's going to leave a mark. With a carbon frame, it could have crushed the fibers, but have no uh, indication of that on the paint outside. So, just to kind of get a grasp of how much wear or tear this bike has been through, I would say I would personally like it if they hadn't heli-taped it, however scrappy the, it might have made the paint work. So, I've done it before, it hasn't bothered me. Um, you know, I've, loads of carbon bikes, they're so strong, and they're, because of the way you can just layer carbon exactly where you want it, you know, you think of the place where a bike might fail, and often they're just overbuilt to the nth degree. You know, you're getting enduro and trail bikes now, which are weighing more than downhill bikes, just because I think a lot of the time they are absolutely overbuilt, which uh, when you're buying secondhand, probably isn't a bad thing. So I hope, I hope that answers your question, although it probably doesn't. Next one is from Batu Setin, and he says, Doddy, why are all stanchions circles? Well, I would imagine it's to do with um, bind. So if you've got a circle in that bush, a cyl cylinder going into a cylinder, yes, you probably do get more um, rotation, but in terms of when the inevitable flex does happen, it doesn't just bind up because it's got no angles for that tension to really kind of meet and to, to meet in lots of friction, take up the form of lots of friction. Um, you could get something like an angled surface riding on a needle, needle bearing, which is basically the internal of a lefty. And one of the reasons it's so incredibly stiff, despite its appearances, it, it's basically due to, due to the fact that all forks will twist, all forks will flex. So let's make a system that allows it to still move once that flex has been introduced to the system. Um, any engineers in the comments, more than welcome to hit me up on that one. Maybe I'm a bit wrong. Maybe I'm a bit right. Maybe it's somewhere around the middle. Um, I think it's pr pretty much that though. Next question is from Sir Scofroff, and he basically wants to know if there is a CO2 canister that can be recharged using a shock pump to help seat tires, especially when out on the trail. It sounds like he's um, hit the jackpot here. He's even encouraging us to get our sponsors on the idea, which is not a bad shout. Now, to one extent, this already does exist. It's called a tubeless booster. Um, Topeak make one. Um, you know, they make them incorporated in track pumps now, or as a kind of standalone unit that's actually the same diameter as a water bottle if you did want to carry it on the trail. Um, and those can go up to, you know, a couple hundred PSI and can boost that tire straight onto the bead, which is very, very good. Although I can understand why you wouldn't want to carry around a large metal canister that is rated to a very high PSI, in your backpack, that, that doesn't make sense to me. But, so in kind of, if you wanted to seat a tire, not using a compressor, that's definitely an easy way to do it. But you say CO2, I don't know if you mean specifically CO2 sized. Now, as far as I'm aware, those CO2 is such a high pressure, it's like eight or 900 PSI. And that CO2 is in liquid form. And it's actually the expansion as it turns into a gas that causes it to have that almost explosive effect that is so good at seating tires. That's also why it gets very cold. But yet yeah, again, I'm calling out to the scientists in the comment. I'm pretty sure it's that. I'm pretty sure they have a like, ridiculously high PSI and it's essentially formed back into a liquid. Um, yeah, which is probably not even a very, very good shock pump would get you there. Next, we have a question from MDDW. And he says, hi guys, I have a question. My new bike has a crank with a three millimeter offset chainring, and now he wants to use a six millimeter offset chainring on it. Can this be done? Well, it could. 
but you're going to be sacrificing a thing called chain line. Chain line is really important in basically where that center sits through the block at the back. Um, it is, has a huge effect. Three mil might not sound like much, but it will have an adverse effect on shifting. Manufacturers are really, really keen to let their bikes have a good chain line and often OEM suppliers, so original equipment suppliers such as Shimano or SRAM, will specify they'll only sign an OEM deal if the manufacturer of the bike is going to keep their chain line in a certain place because they don't want to be blamed for subpar performance. So it is a really, really massive effect. Um, the difference in the three mil between three and six mil, it comes from whether you're running boost or not. So that means your rear end is a different size and you do have a different requirement when it comes to chain line. So yes, you could fit the wrong size, but it is really going to compromise your shift. So I probably, probably wouldn't be onto it. Um, next we have a question from Kyla Anderson and he says, so this is something I've been thinking about for a long time now and I thought I should get your thoughts on it. Okay, cool. Do you think it would be possible for someone to make wireless disc brakes like they make wireless shifters now that they become popular? Well, I mean, it's possible, but I think the issue is not a case of, is it, is it possible? It's would people buy it? You know, people are resistant to buy a rear mech that hasn't got a cable, let alone brakes with no, with no hose. Um, you know, I think you do see it with some electric cars. They do use electric brakes also, but I assume they're being run off an alternator, which kind of nullifies one of the real dangers if you did run out of battery. Like I've had bikes with electric transmissions before and it's definitely happened once and you learn from it. I didn't charge the batteries. But if that happens once on your brakes, you might not get another chance. So um, yeah, there, there is the option for it, but um, I think it's probably we're a little way off it if indeed we ever get there. Um, next, we have a question from Luca Nick, and he says, how would an optimal brake setup look like for a one-handed person? Well, I don't think the optimal brake setup for a person riding with one hand is something I can really do justice. Instead, I'm gonna to throw to Mr. Tom Wheeler and a quick overview of his bike check because my word, he has got a fantastic setup for just riding with one arm. Front end here, so first up, you're running everything on the left-hand side if you look at your controls. Yes. I also noticed that you're running a Shimano and a Magura brake. Yeah. And then you're running a, a right-hand grip shift on the yep. left, flipped around, so just, so tell us about a theory about how some of this is working. Sure, so when I first kind of got into putting my brakes over the top of each other, it was really difficult. We instantly realised that we needed to make some kind of bracket to help with this lower lever position. So this one actually allows to go up and down and you can obviously rotate in and out as well. And yeah, like just making it as slim line as possible because obviously I've got a heck of a lot going on there. I almost ran out of bar. And yeah. I don't like yeah. running my bars particularly wide, so that does get interesting. And there you have it, straight from somebody that knows a lot more about it than I do. If you haven't seen that, I'm going to throw to that video at the end, because it is really cool to check out. Next, we have a question from Cedric Lance Sison, and he says, Hi Henry and Doddy, I'm planning to upgrade my group set to the SLX M7000, but should I get a 1x or a 2x on my cross-country bike? Well, personally, I'm a one by kind of guy. Every day of the week, it's cleaner, it's less maintenance, less setup, less things to break. Um, the range you get out of a modern one by transmission is amazing. Maybe if we were doing, you know, really extreme marathon style riding and you get so tired that just putting weight on the pedals seems like an uphill battle, then yeah, maybe a double then. But apart from that, I think a one by is definitely the one to go, especially more and more frames are going to one by sole compatibility now. So um, yeah, I, I would stick by one by, but that's my two cents. Some people still do like the double, but they're kind of decreasing in number as we speak. And that's it for another show of Ask GMBN Tech. Thank you very much for getting your questions in. If you're sitting at home thinking, well, I've got some questions that need answering, then get in the comments, hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. Now I'm going to throw you to the video of Tom Wheeler and the documentary we made for the channel, which is absolutely fantastic and talks about his process of coming back to mountain biking and adapting his bike to suit. So click down there for that one. And if you want to continue watching with old gubbins over here, I'm going to throw down to my Everest bike check on my Canyon Strive down there. Thank you very much for watching. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.